on eating in the old days. Um, food is always a popular topic and I was really looking forward to this. Um, we're going to be opening a new exhibit on July 21st. Um, it's entitled The Culinary Journey from Germany to Pennsylvania. So please come back when, when that is installed. And we're also going to be doing some more um, food related programs along with that exhibit. Um, the next uh, brand bag program is August 9th at noon and is entitled Eat Yourself Full. Okay. <laughs> the Pennsylvania Dutch food experience in the 20th century. And curator Candace is going to be taking a nostalgic look at the quirky and fun world of Pennsylvania Dutch restaurants, cookbooks, and kitchen foods of the 20th century. Today, however, we're going to be pre 20th century for the most part. Um, our speaker, Alice Wolfgang, is a longtime friend of local food historian Nancy Rowan and has been transcribing Nancy's culinary research files. Uh, Nancy passed away several months ago at the age of 90. Uh, Nancy was a founding member of the Goschenhoffen Historians and a wonderful um, cook and quilt maker. Alice, a culinary enthusiast herself, and longtime leader of the 19th century pie baking demonstrations at the Gotham Festival has combined two of Nancy's presentations into this program about the Pennsylvania Dutch culinary traditions that Nancy preserved for us. I'd like to ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the program and also um, please mute your phones. So um, thank you, Alice. I lost it. <laughs> One second. Uh, yeah, we'll get back to it. Well, if you've been watching all of this that's <laughs> happening up here, you understand why Nancy did her presentations this way. Um, so this um, presentation is a combination of two of hers, and you may have been, sat under some of those um, as well as I did. So preserving the harvest and also the Dutchman and his pies. So before we get hold on started, I keep talking. I'm going to talk forever. Um, how many of you like knew Nancy Rowan? I'm just curious how many people we have here who knew her. Okay. And how many of you like would have listened to one of her presentations that she did with her new cards? Okay. So for some of you, this may be old information. For some of you, new. Um, the difficulty that we're having here is that we're also doing this as a Zoom, and it looks like we're back in there. You can get rid of that. Making progress. Are we good? No. Beth, can you move that share screen share thing? So some of this presentation I will be reading because it is taken directly from Nancy's notes. So I hope you can tell like when I'm quoting from a diary or I'm quoting her or like I couldn't help myself being a retired teacher adding my own two cents for it. So there, it's, it's a mix. And if, you know, if something is confusing even more so than the technology piece, just ask and I'll try to follow, try to clarify. Are we we're good? good. We're yeah. good, okay. So um, eating in the old days. This first part is from Nancy's notes. Cultural background may have made certain dishes desirable for the early immigrants, but the foods eaten were determined by availability. One writer describing the early days, those close to subsistence farmers ate monotonous diets, heavily dependent on regionally abundant staples. Gottlieb Middleberger traveled through Pennsylvania in the mid 1700s. In his journal, he made these observations. They go on. There you go. We're good. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> they grow chiefly rye, wheat, barley, oats, buckwheat, cabbage, and turnips. And you ate what you grew. No trucks, trains, or airplanes bringing foods from all corners of the world. Middleburger failed to mention this. Reading this over. How's that? Can we hear? No. Still can't hear. All right. Okay, we're there. Yeah. Right. Middleburger failed to mention corn 
a new world commodity adopted, it would appear very quickly by the new immigrants eaten to maintain body and soul in the form of mush. <laughs> oh, good. How many of you are familiar with mush, judging by that? Yeah, okay. Mush now, mush and milk for supper and fried mush for breakfast. Okay, I see some nods there. Sometimes the cold mush was broken up in a bowl with hot milk, made an easy breakfast. This was called mush soup. Mush sustained many families. Governor Penny Packer noted in his memoirs, mush and milk makes me tired. <laughs> so just speaking personally, this is not Nancy now, um, we had mush for Sunday night supper. And I have very distinct memories of that and not liking it. Um, as far as I recall, mom never fried it, as we see in the next slide. Um, but I guess Governor Penny Packer wasn't the only one that got tired of it, because I certainly did. Uh, other porridge-like dishes included a pap of thickened milk or water. Sugar helped. There was pumpkin pap and buckwheat pap. Sneaking extra sugar, and here I add, or molasses, because Sunday night I would smear molasses all over the, my plate of mush, and of course eat the molasses, and then eat, eat uh, yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> so here's the molasses that we use. So that was a trick tried by many kids. Sometimes these were served in a common bowl placed in the center of the table, and everyone dipped in with their spoon. And this incidentally is the molasses that I like to use personally for shoe fly. And you can get it in Lancaster County. I don't know if it's available around here, but it is sort of my, my go-to molasses for shoe fly. And here is an incident at my house where Alan Kaiser and Nancy Rowan came for, this was serious, molasses case testing. So I had molasses from Pennsylvania, the one I just showed you. Um, and also from Louisiana and from Alabama. And I made shoe fly with each of the three kinds. We checked the viscosity, the, the scent, um, how you poured it. We passed around the containers like this. I don't know how many hours it took us, but this was serious stuff. And I believe that the Louisiana one was declared most like the barrel molasses of long ago. And I have a distinct memory of Alan Kaiser, like this was the third type. The third piece of shoe fly, we drank coffee in between. And he literally sat back in his chair and set down the fork and said, that's it. And, you know, that was Alan Kaiser. Like, I felt like I had arrived. But that was a that was momentous. So Nancy Rowan, if you didn't already know her, and Alan Kaiser. Rye bread was the loaf of every meal for the family. Wheat bread was for special times, Christmas, funerals, and when the preacher came. Apple butter. A favorite spread for the bread, whether rye or wheat. Uh, you'll see a number of black and white photographs throughout this presentation, and they're from the collection here at the Schwenkfeller Center. Uh, it's the H. Winslow Fegley collection, and they're circa early 1900s. So this one is called the Old Method of Cooking Apple Butter. Most farm families made apple butter annually, or at least every other year. David Schultz in the 18th century noted that bitter apple butter was a cure, and Nancy had that all capitalized, so C-U-R-E, a cure for constipation. <laughs> Sound advice, he got this bit of information from the schoolmaster. T.Y. Brumbach of Shanesville, Berks County, left us his diary with, where he tells of making apple butter. On October 12, 1902, he says he cooked 14 pots of apple butter. This is straining cider before cooking apple butter. In addition to cider, apple butter requires a quantity of peeled or sliced or schnitzed apples. Sometimes this was accomplished via a party, bringing the boys and girls together, perhaps not only, and Nancy also capitalized all of those letters, not only for peeling and schnitzing. Bachelor Garrett Kolb of Skipback writes on September 24, 1844, we were at an apple butter party at A.B. Markley's until two o'clock. That was in quotes from his diary. Don't we wish he had told us more of what went on? I assume that was 2 a.m. Surely they wouldn't have ended at 2 p.m. Here's apple butter being poured into cans. We do know that apple butter is always cooked in a copper kettle. David Schultz, as a recent immigrant in the 1730s, writes home to his family and suggests that if they come to America, 
to bring a copper kettle as copper is so dear here. Here's a load of apple butter. The dowry records of three generations of the Clemens family of Lower Salford Township included copper kettles for each of the girls. In 1756, Jacob Schultz's daughter Barbara received a copper kettle valued at three pounds. A cow was valued at three pounds. So that shows us then how important the copper was. A mare was five pounds. Heinrich Klemmer in 1834 gave his daughter Elizabeth a barrel sized copper kettle. Is a cider press. Many gallons of cider flowed from cider presses like this one. Valley Pennsylvania Mennonite preacher John Gaiman's diary reveals making cider 13 times in 1835. Cider was preserved for the winter by boiling and putting it away in barrels. Whiskey was sometimes added to cider to make a product called Cider Royal. Here is sucking cider through rye straw. Instead of adding whiskey, preacher Jake Mensch, preacher, gives this formula for preserving cider as Mensch writes, to keep it fit to drink. To 48 gallons of cider, add one pint of alcohol, two ounces of wintergreen, and two ounces of sassafras. And then Nancy speculates, how much effect would this have had? We also must remember that cider was allowed to mature into vinegar. John Gaiman notes on September 24, 1866, made a barrel of cider for vinegar. Generally, cider was made from water cider, which is the result of soaking the pumice left from pressing the cider. This Applejack distillery was located in Burnville. Apples were taken to the distillery where they were transformed into a beverage much esteemed by the Pennsylvania Germans in what appeared to have been a boom year for cider in 1835. John Gaiman also takes apples to the distillery two times. His neighbor to the north, John Krause of Crowsdale, made over a thousand gallons in 1806. This is the reproduction bake oven that is at the 1736 Auntie's House, which is where the Goshenhoppen Folk Festival is held. That's in August, uh, 11th and 12th this year. So you would see this being worked that, during that festival. The bake oven offered an efficient way to dry apple schnitz. Preacher Jake Mensch of Skipback reminds us in his diary on August 23rd, 1899, about two kinds of schnitz, some sweet and some sour apples. The residual heat from the baking dries them nicely. A bushel of cut up apples can be put in at one time on specially filled wooden trays and overnight, they will dry. John Landis notes in 1882, got peaches at an orchard, cut them up, put them in the oven to dry on a Monday. <laughs> Sweet schnitz were used unpeeled for schnitz and nep. I have to ask, how many of you are familiar with schnitz and nep? Okay, how many of you make schnitz and nep? Ooh, that was just one hand. How many of your moms made schnitz and nep? Okay, there we go. I remember my mom making it once or twice. And Sarah, did you mention that we're sisters? You did mention that we're sisters? Oh, we're sisters. Anyway, <laughs> I can remember mom very distinctly making the schnitz and nep, which is a, a stew of sweet apple slices and ham. And then you put dumplings on top, you put a lid on um, to steam the dumplings. And I remember her distinctly saying, and not to lift the lid or the dumplings would go flat. Sarah, you want to add anything to that story? <laughs> so Nancy goes on to say, some say it is a dish fit for a king. The sour schnitz were for schnitz pie and they were peeled. So you schnitz and apples, two different kinds. So there's two kinds. And Nancy says a real pie with a top crust and a schnitz rivla cooker. Schnitz were apparently enjoyed by young students and were swiped from the supply. One lady recalled her grandmother would remark when she found her schnitz had been gotten into, oh, the mice were at my schnitz again. She knew the mice only had two legs. <laughs> Another reminded the kids to not eat too many schnitz lest they would explode. <laughs> 
There. We got it. Yeah. This is Elba Cooka, a fresh apple pie called a cooka or cake because it has no top crust. Best made with yellow transparent apples, which because of progress in advanced technology, you can't get anymore. Those were Nancy's words. Now, when I lived in Berks County, I did grow yellow transparent apples and they are absolutely the best apples for baking and for applesauce. And so that photo in the left-hand corner there, I'm in mean the right-hand corner, that is a plate of the yellow transparent apples. I have seen them at the Shady Maple grocery store. They don't look quite like that. So I'm a little suspicious, but I buy them and say, oh, I'm still using, using the right thing. Cherries. In addition to drying apples, cherries too were dried. Some historians feel that the dried cherry pie was an earlier funeral pie preceding the raisin. So this slide shows one of our um, funeral pies at the Gosh and Hoppin Festival that would be here um, that was made with raisins and then also fresh and dried cherries. So at the festival, we do make um, a raisin pie. We call it a funeral pie because um, assuming that, that raisins would be readily available whenever someone would pass away unexpectedly, that was a pie that you could make. And Nancy um, says that also uh, cherries were used. Now, one thing I forgot to mention in the beginning with like um, our, our challenges that we were having is that there are some recipes throughout this program. You are most welcome to copy them down. In fact, we have paper and pencil that get passed out, Sarah. Yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to copy recipes, you're welcome to take a picture of the slide um, or ask me later, you know, I can email it to you. It's just, if you're interested, there are, um, paper and pencil, or you can just enjoy. <laughs> so I had to include cherry fritters, um, sort of thinking in um, one of my mom's tablets. How many of you have a handwritten tablet from your mother of recipes? Like that is such a treasure to me. And she has a recipe there. These recipes are all from Nancy Rowan's um, supplies, but my mom had a recipe for sour cherry fritters. And as I read through the recipe, it didn't mention cherries. <laughs> so I assume you just would know. <laughs> this recipe does have cherries. It does call for a cup of pitted cherries. If anyone is copying it, I do want to give you time to do that. But if not interested, I can just keep going too. So I think the sour cherries are excellent in fritters. Here's an interesting story from Nancy's childhood involving the wild black cherries. And I'll read this because this, this is her words. The cherries were small, smaller than a dime, deep black with a slight red tinge, but they were tasty. We had a cherry pitter, which only partially lived up to its name. So my mother preferred to pit them by hand. I was not pleased with the pitting job. This little black cherry can't be duplicated. These cherries, when mixed with the well-known red sour pie cherry, resulted in a super flavor treat. I might add that, yes, there was the occasional worm, but keeping your eyes open and your ears peeled when pitting eliminated the problem. My mother always said she could hear when there was a worm. When the cherry was squeezed to expel the seed, there was an audible squeak. Oh. Worked every time. <laughs> Brown cherry pie, also not easy to get anymore. Those who love ground cherries care about these things. And I know there's two individuals in this room that would agree with that. Those who don't are just as happy to eat something else. So here again is 19th century fruit pie demonstration at Gosh and Happen. So here's a ground cherry plant. So it's a plant that's grown in your garden and the ground cherries then fall to the ground. And here's a bowl with some of them that we've cleaned. And then here is the ground cherry pie. Very popular with some folks, and here, here is the, the recipe for it. Um, doesn't take a lot of sugar because brown cherries are fairly sweet as they are. So just a little brown sugar, a little flour to thicken it. Um, some recipes will add a bit of cinnamon. This one doesn't seem to, um, but there's the ground cherry pie. 
and then uh, an elderberry. I really can't see that at the bottom of the screen. So an elderberry or mica cap pie um, with sweet dough strips. Anybody happen to know what mica cap stands means in Pennsylvania Dutch? Wow. Yeah, fly's head, exactly. <laughs> and if you know elderberries or can see well enough, you can see why. Writing in the mid 20th century, Preston Barba stated, okay. in quotes, the eastern counties of Pennsylvania, that's, that's us guys, constitute the pie belt of America. In this area, more and better pies are eaten in greater variety than anywhere else on the terrestrial globe. And the <laughs> quote. Yeah, there you go. At the time they were writing, the Dutchman had been here for over 250 years and had enthusiastically, that's Nancy's word, adopted the pie from his English speaking neighbors. Hmm, familiar face. <laughs> pie is an English institution. Pie was unknown to the German in immigrants when they came here in 1683. And since the German has no word for pie in his dialect, he accepted the English word along with the product. No pie in the homelands? Possibly the closest thing, as some historians suggest, was a flat yeast dough covered in fruit. If this came to America, and it probably did, it was ultimately replaced by the Englishman's pie with pastry taking the place of the yeast dough. Here's a black raspberry mm -hmm. custard by Alan Kaiser. So he both made the pie and it is his favorite pie. I am not suggesting you make possum pie. <laughs> There's a story here that Nancy did not have in her notes. So I, just, I have a very distinct memory of her calling me and laughing so hard um, that she could hardly tell me the story. And I don't know how many of you heard the story of the possum and the pie. Oh, good. Um, so Matthew, her son, had gone out and picked wild raspberries. And she made a pie for her son out of, it wasn't a custard, it was all raspberries, black raspberries. And she put it out on their porch um, to cool. So there's a table out there and, and she had the pie there. And the next time she looked, there was a possum sitting in the middle of it, sitting in the pie, eating it. He was all purple and looking very pleased with himself. You know, of course I said, did you get a picture? And she, she was just laughing so hard. And then I'm like, well, did Matthew? Like, what did he think? I, I, I don't know, but I'm just guessing he wasn't too pleased about the possum getting his pie. Okay, let me get back here. That's good. So as late as the 1920s, that's Nancy's notes. Now, late as the 1920s doesn't sound so recent to us, um, but she would have been interviewing somebody who was older. Um, and this is a the interview was quite a while ago. So as late as the 1920s, John Klein, proprietor of the Perkium and Heights Hotel, that was at the intersection of Route 63 and Kutztown Road. Anybody here remember that? Okay, we do have some people that remember that. Um, they made this pie or swivel puka or an onion cake. It's a yeast dough with onions on top. So that was something that was made there. This particular one is made by the 18th century house at the Antis house at the Goshenhoppen Festival. And it is a much sought after treat. So it's a yeast dough um, with onions, cream, bacon. And we need to do a circulation right now. Um, and here was my uh, first attempt at swivel lapoca, and I did this, oh, like last month, um, not knowing how much bacon, how much onions, I just did a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Rolled the dough certainly flatter than what um, the previous slide showed, um, and then it's cream that you pour over top and just, you know, we had no problems eating that up. <laughs> Maybe the earliest reference to pie in the Dutch country is from an unpublished Bethlehem diary on August the 3rd, 1745, when Native Americans visited Bethlehem, the Moravians held a feast. The visitors brought huckleberries, which were made into pies. And Nancy credits Alan Kaiser for sharing, in quotes, this most important bit of research. So that was, she wanted to credit Alan for finding that, 1745. The typical pie dish of the Pennsylvania Dutch housewives was a circular disc of red clay formed into a shallow one to one and a half inch deep with a rounded bottom plate. The edge was often notched and had no rim. 
sorrel pie. Nancy says, an almost forgotten pie. I have never had it and never had heard of it. Anybody here know sorrel pie? That's the plant. Most of the images that I took here are either ones I took, borrowed some from Bob Wood um, and some from the Fegley collection. This was one I did what Bob Wood refers to as S-O-T-I somewhere on the internet. So I got the plant. Um, she, Nancy says, once widely used by our Pennsylvania German forefathers, both as a vegetable and as pie filling, sorrel deserves to be reestablished in our cookery. And she says, if you like rhubarb pie, you will like sorrel pie. So now how many people are interested? <laughs> and I do have the recipe here for you. Um, what you can't see at the bottom of the screen <laughs> is a note that she had written that Larry Neff tried this. And I don't know who Larry Neff is. If he's in the room, that would be delightful. Um, and the next line was, it needs help. <laughs> so you know, I'm not real anxious. I don't have sorrel. I don't know where you get sorrel. <clears throat> I don't know if you had enough sugar and cinnamon, if it would taste good. If any of you try it, let me know. Not everyone appreciates the fine fruit rhubarb. These are my words. My dear friend, Mel Baker, has the audacity to refer to it as a weed. Where, where are our rhubarb enthusiasts in here? Yes, yes, absolutely. Wish Mel was here, she could see that. Um, so this is just a bowl of pineapple rhubarb custard that I made. So apparently sorrel rhubarb. Pumpkin pie, the old time pumpkin pie is diced pumpkin, not cooked and pureed, made into a pie similar to the way an apple pie with a top crust is made. You don't encounter pumpkin pie very often anymore. And I remember Nancy talking to me about this. And if we were on the phone and I was talking about Thanksgiving and I'd say something about making pumpkin pie, I would get corrected. It's not pumpkin pie, it's pumpkin custard. Pumpkin pie, and then she'd tell me about this. So she yeah, knew what she was talking about. So in this slide, I have her handwritten recipe because I like seeing her handwriting. You see the recipe comes from her mom and um, I can read it for you. I don't think I typed this one, no. Um, it says cut raw peeled pumpkin into small pieces about the size of corn kernels. Now I would think, you know, from the image there that the, the pieces are larger than corn kernels, but that's what her mother says. Put into an uh, unbaked pie shell, sweetened with molasses, sprinkled with cinnamon, cover with the top crust. And then you see down here at the bottom, Nancy added her bit of flour and brown sugar, which that was her thought. So this is from her tablet that stayed in 1945. So she had her mother's recipe in there. Lemon pies of various sorts. Lemon strip, lemon sponge lemon meringue became popular in the 19th century. So in my words here, in the 1929 Willing Workers Cookbook of Sunnytown, there's five pages that are devoted to pies. Within those five pages are 10 lemon pie recipes. So absolutely. Um, and this is one that we make, make, we do make it every year at the Goshenoppen Festival. And it's one that we didn't burn. So I have a good picture of it. <laughs> Um, but so far in the Nancy Rowan archives, the recipes that I'm transcribing, there are 34 lemon pies. I, there could easily be duplication there. I have not looked at that, but there's but 34 times I have typed up a recipe for lemon pie. So here is the lemon crumb that you just saw. Um, you can't see the um, time and temp at the bottom, and that is just a guess. But if you if you take a picture of this, or write this recipe down. Um, I suggest baking it at 375 uh, for 40 to 45 minutes. And I actually don't know, because I don't know that I've ever made this with electricity. We made this at the festival and it's a wood cook stove and it's just like, when it's done, we get it out. Um, and so, you know, when it says it makes three, that's probably the smaller pie dish. It's not what we would know today as a, a nine inch pie. So again, I'm just guessing two. Nine inch, I think if I made this at home today, I would probably make one pie and just put the rest in a bowl and bake it and like eat that up too. So that does it. All good. Remember slop pie? Oh, there's some murmurs, okay. <laughs> the last remnant of pie crust from the weekly baking is fitted into an appropriately sized pie dish, 
Sugar, flour, and milk with some bits of butter are added and it's baked. In our home, we added cinnamon. Anybody else do that? Okay. And sometimes molasses. I don't know if we were just angling for more sweet. I don't know. And recently, Candace Perry shared that she heard Nancy saying her mother added chocolate. Oh. So I, anybody here, like, I could hear some agreement with that, but um, so slot pie. None of these pies would have been possible without lard. I'm not going to go into butchering, don't worry. <laughs> Pig's stomach, like Utakasha, which is the, the Dutch for ground cherries, stuffed pig stomach has its followers and that is well. At one time, according to historian H.W. Creeble, the Christmas good cheer comprised of the roasted now of a pig stuffed with a mixture of potatoes, bread, onion, and spare ribs. Pig stomach for Christmas. Obviously, there were never vast quantities of these things and then only a butchering time when the weather was cold. Anybody here ever make pig stomach? Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware that clean pig stomachs can be purchased at the Shady Maple grocery store. They have them in the, the freezer section. So if you want to try it, here would be the recipe. Again, it's very general. Um, you know, onion and bread, brownie and butter with sausage, potatoes. Uh, it says sausage. It doesn't indicate whether it was smoked or fresh. I think judging by the picture, sorry, okay. um, that to me looks like smoked sausage in what they're doing here. And this would have been from Nancy Rowan and Gail Albert had gotten a grant from Pennsylvania Council of the Arts and did, um, but they spent a year like creating these old recipes and studying and learning together. And so this image is from there. So the recipe is here, um, again, very general in terms of its contents. And Nancy's notes had said spare ribs. This does not include spare ribs. I tried this once. I tried a lot of things once uh, many years ago. And you know, the pig stomach is not that large. Like, I don't know how you would fit spare ribs in there. I, 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 I used smoked sausage when I did it. But since I only did it once, I'm not sure it was all that successful. So here's making Lieberwurst. Sausage used to be cheap food. Now that it's fast food for our fast paced lives, it's pricey. Sausage was both smoked and canned to preserve it for a later time. Scrapple, how many of you are familiar with Scrapple? Yeah, I thought I'd see everybody. How many of you like Scrapple? Ah, awesome, this is a good crowd. So here's stirring Scrapple at the Mennonite Heritage Center, I believe at their apple butter frolic. I do have the recipe for this. I didn't know if anybody was interested in it, so I didn't type it. Oops, oops, oops. go back one here. Oh, that is scrambled. Yeah. Um, so this is from Nancy's 1945 tablet. I can just read it for you. If you want to make 75 pounds of scrapple, this is what I'm going to do. So you need 20 quarts of broth, you need 30 to 35 pounds of cooked ground meat, skins, et cetera. Um, three and a half to 10 pounds scrapple pans equal this. So if you're using your scrapple pans, that's how you can measure. A half to three fourths um, cup of margarine, five tablespoons of coriander, six tablespoons of pepper, a cup of salt, three and three quarter pounds of buckwheat flour and two pounds of cornmeal. So when I read through this, I huh, that's gluten free, isn't it? Hmm. So this amount yields from, it's from two 250 pound hogs, but skins from only one, no ears or liver. So just, yeah, because you want your liver for liver pudding. So that's the liver from two 200 pound pigs. We have salt, pepper, buckwheat broth from the scrapple pot, and some skins, a little fat, and then margarine and coriander are in that as well. Anybody going to try this? I actually was privileged back in Jan January. My cousin's husband's family makes scrapple, and I got myself invited pretty much by saying, What are you doing it? <laughs> and then texting her like every week, is it tomorrow? Like, when is this? And so I got to help these guys. And they, this was in Berks County. Um, 
there, there was a lot of Dutch spoken, which amused them because I don't know what they were saying. Um, but I got to help make the scrapple and go home with a pan of scrapple. Like I thought that was great fun. So one of the interesting things about working with Nancy's note cards is she wrote these note cards to herself to give presentations. And she used a lot of abbreviations and acronyms and initials and it took me a while to figure them out. So when I came across SFP, I'm like, oh, Nancy, like, now what is that? Anybody want to take a guess? You just shout it out. I didn't figure it out right away either. I had to keep reading. Sugar, flour. Oh, that's all. That's good. Oh, you can switch to the next slide. Yeah. Shoe fly pot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> I just need to go to that. <laughs> switch. Okay. Oh, so what is the origin of shoe fly pie? The jury, this is Nancy, the jury is still out on this. There does not seem to be a real well documented source for the origin of shoe fly pie or even the name. One food historian attributes it to the 1876 Centennial in Philadelphia, where it was called Centennial Cake. He suggests that it moved from Philly to the Pennsylvania Dutch country where it became shoe fly pie. Nancy didn't agree with that. More likely, as I see it, the hucksters from Bucks and Montgomery counties took it to the city. We do find recipes for centennial cake, but none I found will make a shoe fly pie as we know it. And no one knows where the name comes from. Lots of speculation by food historians and John Q. Public. Most popular, I guess, is the thought currently suggested by the people at the Shady Maple Smorgasbord that the sweet aroma from a shoe fly cooling on a kitchen windowsill would draw flies, and of course, they need to be shooed. And then Nancy, I mean, this is all handwritten, but she went over it a bunch of times. So picture bold print, I've never seen any kind of pie cooling on a windowsill. So <laughs> that's her opinion there. So this picture is from a class that I taught at the Mennonite Heritage Center. Interestingly, we all use the same recipe. We, I did have the different types of molasses there, but I just thought how interesting that a group of, it was all women, a group of women made these shoe fly pies from this recipe. And I do have this type if you wanna um, copy it down. We all use the same recipe and this is the one that Nancy gave me. I don't use my mother's, I use this one, um, but I like seeing it of course in her handwriting. And then here I have it typed for you if you want to, Take a picture, of course, write it down. It's quite simple. You just make crumbs and then you make the, the liquid to make your shoe fly. <laughs> if anybody is writing something and you need it longer, just let me know before I change the slide. Okay, we're good. Funnel cake, along with shoe fly pie, is probably the best known PD food item in the country. PD being Pennsylvania Dutch. I, I, I started using her acronym for that too. Every carnival has them on the boardwalk at Atlantic City. Thomas Rhodes, Boyertown doctor in the late 19th century, put his childhood memories into poetry. I don't have a copy of that poem, a poem about funnel cake. I, yeah, I, I haven't researched that, but there you go. Thomas Rhodes, if you want to look it up. <laughs> Fosnots eaten on Shrove Tuesday with molasses. The true Fosnot dough also includes potato, but possibly only since the mid 18th century. The lard so important to pie crust and frying potatoes for breakfast is employed to fry the fosnuts. And here's Nancy's recipe from her tablet dated 1945. Um, you can just see, you know, see that have the stains and how um, comments that she added. And then here it is typed out if you um, want to actually have the recipe more clear. Really. However, did the Dutchman get along without potatoes? As of 1750, the potato had not yet emerged as a significant part of the diet. But once they did, they were heartily embraced and became unnecessary. Sometimes three times a day. Has anybody here eaten potatoes three times a day? Anybody willing to eat potatoes three? Yeah, there we go. P.Y. Brumbach's diary of 1920 tells of his potato growing. Booba shankle, mm -hmm. noodle dough filled with mashed potatoes or some other things. After they're boiled, they're fried in butter and then topped with buttered crumbs, sometimes eaten with milk. 
you'll not find Vuvashenko on the Weight Watchers recommended list. Um, how many of you have had Vuvashenko? Okay. Anybody make Vuvashenko? Mm -hmm. um, at the 19th century house at the Goshenhopen Festival, they do make Vuvashenko. So if you get there at the right time, you get to taste them. I, I did work at this for a while because I actually entered a competition to make Vuvashenko. And my first batch, I, I had the dough light, nice and thin, really filled it up, you know, with the potatoes. And of course, when I put it in the boiling water, it just all disintegrated. It literally was open this patio door and just heave it out. Um, so I got better at it, but I haven't kept up with it. So here is the recipe from Nancy's tablet dated 1945. So pot pie noodles on the top, and then the filled noodles are down here at the bottom. And she says, cut above dough, rolled thin, not too thin, with a Crisco pan. Place well-seasoned mashed potato on the circle, moist, moisten, fold over and seal, cook 10 minutes in boiling stock, and then fry in butter. And you can't see too well down at the bottom, but she added a later note saying, add sauteed onion and celery and seasonings like potato filling. <laughs> Schmear case. Here we have schmear case in the making. Today we call it cottage cheese, which in Nancy's words, bears little resemblance to the old fashioned schmear case. Lots was eaten on bread with molasses in the fresh state. Nancy doesn't mention it in her presentation, but cottage cheese custards are very delectable and also can be eaten with some molasses. Anybody have memories of cottage cheese custard eating it with molasses? Was it just our house? Huh. All right. Well, we make them at the festival. So here are some waiting to go in the oven. This would be a schnitz pie. So that's not a cottage cheese custard. But those are cottage cheese custards. And they are very delectable. Here is a cheese custard pie made by Nancy Rowan and a slice with some traditional molasses. The recipe is from Alan Kaiser's family. So here is... Um, the whole recipe, including how to make the schmear quesa. Um, and I included that just because of Nancy's fun note there at the top. The cheese called schmear quesa is really easy to make and will provide you with superb cottage cheese for a cheese custard. I was always under the impression whole unpasteurized milk was needed to make cheese. Well, you don't need to be on a first name basis with a cow to make this cheese. <laughs> Um, and that's NR is the anterior man. And so this recipe from Joan Kaiser Landis, that would be Alan Kaiser's sister, um, uses a gallon of skim milk and buttermilk. So that's the full recipe. Here's just the recipe for the pie. I think you, you could make with commercial cottage cheese. So you do not have to go through meeting a cow. And if you want something even simpler, I'm giving you this one. This is not one from Nancy. Uh, this is one I made recently, and it's from the Mennonite Community Cookbook, and it's really, really easy. This is basically a custard with some cottage cheese stirred in. So you can start out simple and work your way up if you want. And AB cake. <laughs> this familiar breakfast cake has been around in one form or another since the 18th century. Interesting to think that it's being baked in modern convection ovens, but also baked in the centuries old bake oven. And these particular AB cakes were, were made at the Goshenhoffen Festival last year. Here is Nancy's Grammy's recipe. I love this, her opinion. I also love that this recipe makes two, but then she calculated how to make four. Oh, but then how to make eight of them. So her Grammy's AB cake recipe. Now I have the transcribed recipe on the next slide. There are 18, and th these are different, different AP cake recipes in her files that I found so far. I'm not done transcribing yet. So there's 18 different versions of AP's cake and even how it's said, we grew up saying AB cake. Mm -hmm. Some people say AP cake. Um, this you see like almost a piece. I've seen it like with two words like A and then piece, almost like a piece of cake. Um, so, yeah, there's there's quite a variety there, but very um, very popular item is you know AB cake dough is used as the sweet dough strips, the pie that I showed you, uh, the schnitz pie sitting on the stove. Those those strips on top were made out of AB cake dough. You can also use the dough for cookies. So it's a very versatile 
thing to have. And the bake oven. The cavernous chamber can hold up to 15 loaves of bread. Just to show how clever, clever our foremothers were, pies were placed on a long handled shovel peel and deposited any place the baker desired within the oven by quickly pulling the peel out from under the pie. I've tried this at our wood stove at the festival, and it's not easy. So this is you know deeper. So I, I have a lot of respect for this lady here. So this would be disastrous with a custard pie. In that case, the empty pie shell is easily placed in the oven and the custard is poured in using a custard ladle. No spills that way. Around 1840 to 50, the cast iron cooking stove came to Pennsylvania. John Gaiman, farmer, minister, and huckster from the Valley area, while on a trip to Philadelphia in 1844, buys a cooking stove. A week later, the carpenters came and closed the hearth. But many people continued to use the bake oven. When I asked one lady, this is Nancy speaking, asked one lady why, she said, oh, you couldn't get it all in the oven of the stove like this. How relieved Mrs. G must have been. The stove may not have had an oven large enough for weekly baking, but it offered some mighty nice advantages. Reflected heat, smoke, and it was waist high. <laughs> so the stove that we grew up with looked a lot like this one. Um, this temperature gauge, that serves no purpose. I have never met a wood cook stove where the temperature gauge like meant anything. <laughs> they just get as hot or, as, or not as hot as you'd like. So that one reminds me of home. <clears throat> but I can also agree with, oops, still back, back to that one. Just mm -hmm. go back one. Yeah. Um, but the, the idea of it being waist high and being so much easier to work with, the very first time I volunteered at the, at the Gashnachan Festival decades ago, I was in the 18th century where you were bending over and over uh, open, open fire, like open hearth cooking. And I very quickly volunteered for the 19th century <laughs> because I you know, wanted none of that. This seems like wonderful in comparison. <laughs> Samuel Johnson said, quotes, man seldom thinks with more earnestness of anything than he does his dinner, end of quote. Today, we do think quite a lot about our dinner, but hardly do we give much thought anymore to dinners in the future. Looking at diaries, account books, inventories, and wills from the 18th through the early 20th century gives us insight into the time and energy spent on preserving the harvest. Mm -hmm. Maria Yakel, wife of a Berks County doctor, tells us through her diaries of the many chores associated with the putting away of food in the year 1869. Are you ready for this? Beginning in the middle of June, she relates that she canned gooseberries, preserved strawberries, picked cherries and currants, canned currants, picked cherries for drying, fixed cherries for drying, made currant wine, picked and cooked beans for drying, cleaned and scalded the pickled barrel, made sauerkraut, boiled cider, schnitzed some apples, I'm not done, preserved quinces, preserved blackberries, and made jelly picked off elderberries to dry, canned peaches and tomatoes, prepared to make apple butter, made apple butter, cooked corn to dry. At one point she writes, hot enough to melt a body. Can, can we all relate to that? Then on July 22nd, it gets better. Felt bad all afternoon. Baby came in the evening. She also had a 19-month-old boy. The preservation work did not end for Maria when the garden and orchard stopped producing. Prepared to butcher, sold the sausages, made pickle for meat, and on and on. Some things require little preparation for storing, and New England pumpkins are kept under the bed. Here in Pennsylvania, they're kept in the barn or the cellar. However, my grandmother kept sweet potatoes under the bed. This is Nancy speaking. Not everything is as simple as pumpkins and sweet potatoes. In contrast, you can't store apples under the bed. Adding sugar for making preserves was a popular method to keep fruit, but it required an expenditure of money for sugar. Crocs, fruit cooked with sugar, were packed in crocs, not to be covered with paraffin, but sheep tallow, and then covered with paper or a bladder from a pig. The Dutchman here will surely recognize the word chow chow. Show of hands on that one. Yeah. Chow chow take, takes the end of the garden to ultimate heights and is still a popular side dish to any dinner. 
This dish would not have been possible before the development of the mason jar and process of hermetically sealing food in the jar about 1850. Before that time, salt and vinegar and sugar in quantities that affected both the taste and texture were required to adequately preserve foods. And this is Nancy's uh, recipe here for the liquid for the chow chow here on the left. Um, down here, the note that's cut off says that it's enough for like five to six. I can't see it on here either. Five to six pints of, of chow chow. 1872, John Landis is married. He writes he bought one dozen fruit jars. 1882, Jay Lederach sold his first glass jars, three or four or six in quantity at one time, 13 cents each. And according to inflation calculators, that would be $3.60. Pretty pricey for a, a jar. It was much later until the seal was perfected. After World War I, when mechanically blown jars could be made, they became affordable and rapidly became a new and important household industry. And this recipe is also from Nancy's 1945 personal tablet. I was planning to end with this slide because, you know, it's pie and one should end all things with pie. But just to show you that research keeps going, I recently discovered, thanks to my sister, Sarah, Moravian sugar cake. So this is something new that I, I'm trying out to make because I'm making it for an event here and I wanted to make sure I could do it. The dough is very similar to the dough of a raised cake, if you're familiar with that although it's softer. Like as soon as I started working with it, I'm like, ooh, this is like richer and softer than a raised cake dough. Um, so here's the recipe from Nancy's file that can give you the proportions. And what I thought was so interesting was when I, okay, so I read this in her, like I had typed this recipe, I read it, I'm not gonna copy the whole thing down. I didn't wanna have my computer open. I just quickly hand wrote the, um, the ingredients. That's all you need, right? And I knew you had to punch holes. Punch holes, okay, I used a fork. So I punched holes, I mean, it worked just fine. And let me go back one, Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, so it looks like that. So I punched holes. And then when I was getting ready for this presentation, I'm like, ooh, I missed that bit. You punch holes with your thumb. <laughs> oh, okay, that's gonna make something different. So then of course, you know, went on the internet. And this is the website, southerncastiron.com. So this is what, this is quoted from there. Moravian sugar cake is a centuries old culinary specialty of the Winston-Salem, North Carolina region. Anybody happen to be from North Carolina? Anybody familiar with this cake? Ah, we do have, okay. So folklore holds, this is still from the South, Southern Cast Iron website. Folklore holds that the original Moravian male settlers to the area sought women with big fingers because that meant that more buttery sweetness would make it into the nooks and crannies of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> However, the recipe they gave did not provide, did not mention mashed potatoes. So obviously the recipe that's kind of migrated into our neck of the woods has mashed potatoes in it. But the next time I make it, I will indeed, you know, use my thumb. So we're ending with the Moravian sugar cake rather than pot. Again, these are um, this most of this information came from two of Nancy's presentations, Dutchman and his pies, and preserving the harvest. Um, so thank you for listening and enjoying this with me. And if you have questions, I'll gladly try to answer them. Yes, sir. Uh, the cottage cheese custard, mm -hmm. is that also what you use in what we call Easter pie? Because I think it's an Italian pie. Is that ricotta, maybe? I'm not familiar with Easter pie. Do they use ricotta cheese, maybe? Could be, but I wonder if it's mixed with cottage cheese. Hmm. I see somebody nodding behind you, so. Good question. Yes. Which one? Um, yeah, Moravian sugar cake. Also, Alice, can you please repeat the questions? Thank you. Um, 
Okay, she was asking to go back a slide to this. What you can't see here at the bottom is to bake it. All right, the instructions said bake it at 400 for 12 minutes. That's not near long enough. Um, I think I did it for 20 and the inside, it looked fine, but the inside was a little gooey. So I, next time I try it, maybe I'll do 375 for 30 to 35 minutes, maybe. So for the Moravian sugar cake. Um, and the earlier question was if the cottage cheese custard was like Easter pie made by, did you say it, Italians, the Italian tradition? And the answer from another member of the audience was that um, that was more likely ricotta. Yes. Did they say funny cake? Um, there are recipes for funny cake in her um, in her archives, but not in her presentation about pies. It, it does seem like shoe fly is far more well known and popular and loved than funny cake. <laughs> we could do something about that, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. The expression put up Okay. The question is, where did the expression put up come from? As in put up so many ports. Right. Okay. Having grown up with that expression, I can't tell you other than it came from my mother, <laughs> who was right about all things. Anybody, Bob? Would you happen to know where that shelf always up high? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. So the jars were high. So, no, I, yeah, I don't. That's as good an answer as any. Yeah, I don't know. Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Where is the Gotchen Hopkins Folk Festival? So the, the question is, where is the Gotchen Hopkins Folk Festival? It's held at the Auntie's House, which is on Colonial Road, just down from Frederick Living. Um, so if you're on Route 73. If you go to goshenhoppen.org, you can you know see a map and get directions and so forth. Um, and the festival is August 11 and 12. Um, and yeah, hope to see you there. Come visit the fruit pie demonstration. <laughs> yes. Why so many lemon pie recipes? Were lemons readily available? Okay, the question is why so many lemon pie recipes um, were they readily available? And that indeed is what we speculate because there were so many. They also keep really well. You know, like if you have berries this time of year and no refrigeration, you know, they don't keep long. A lemon would. Um, and I guess we're close enough to the Port of Philadelphia that they were they weren't expensive. And you also don't need a whole lot, like one lemon can give you two or three pies. Yeah, I don't know, all those things. We always make them at the festival though, because people like them so much. So yeah, are there any questions? Okay, all righty. Well, if, if any of you, you know, wanted to copy down recipes and didn't get it or whatever, I, I'll happily share it with you now. But thank you very much for coming. I just want to, I thought I was like in charge of it. I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs>